that's the thing about fishing. Whether you're doing it for fun or you're doing it for a living, one thing's for sure, you're always fixing your nets. No, I used to, but now it's just to relax. If you call this relaxing. Peter. Although, in these parts, most people still think of me as Simon, son of John, but I go by Peter. That's the name he gave me. Jesus. Of Nazareth. Yeah, I knew him. He's my master, my redeemer, my friend. He's my king. I remember the first time I met him, I was doing just this when my brother Andrew came up to me and he said, Simon, we found the Messiah. And I said, really? And he said, no, you've got to come really quickly. And so he brought me to Jesus. And I remember as I was approaching Jesus, Jesus looked at me and said, you are Simon. You will be called Peter. And I remember thinking, well, I don't know if this guy's the Messiah, but I like his judge of character. Like after all, Peter, Petros, rock, solid one. He had me right. So I thought. We were still fishing with our dad, so we didn't have a lot of time, but the time that we did have, we spent, we spent every minute of it with Jesus, listening to him, watching him. I remember early on, we were at this wedding over in Cana, and uh, it was a disaster. Uh, we went to this wedding with Jesus, and uh, they ran out of wine. Talk about an embarrassment. And uh, I remember... I remember Jesus' mother Mary is like hovering over him and saying, you know, they have no wine. What are you going to do? And Jesus is kind of saying, well, you know, uh, not my wedding, not my problem. Um, finally, Mary throws up her arms and she says, whatever he tells you, do it. And the servants, they had nothing to do. So they're all kind of standing around. And Jesus looks over at these ceremonial pots that are used for like washing and uh and he says fill them all up these things were huge and uh he said fill them all up with water didn't really make any sense but mary said whatever he tells you do it so the servants they got nothing else to do they fill up these pots with water and he says now now give some of it to the master of ceremonies and so they they, they draw out this uh, this water and they're looking at it and as they take it to him they, they hand it to him and, and he tastes it and his eyes light up and he says, this is, the, this is the finest wine I've ever tasted. We all remembered that Mary said, whatever he tells you, do it. And the result was the very best. He, he did other miracles, physical miracles, changing things, changing people by healing them, but, but his... It didn't stop there. He he also changed the way we understood each other. I remember we were down, and again, this was early on. We were down in Jerusalem for Passover, and uh, we had to go back to Galilee. And Jesus said, we have to go through Samaria. And I said, no, we don't. We can just uh, cross over the Jordan, go up through Perea and back into Galilee. And we don't have to travel through Samaria, the, the land of those spiritual misfits. And Jesus said, no, we're, we're going through Samaria. And we not only went through Samaria, we stopped outside of this town. And Jesus sent all of us into town to, to get some food. And, and when we came back, he's talking to a woman. Imagine that, a, a Jewish rabbi talking to a Samaritan woman. And not just any Samaritan woman, we found out she had a really sordid past and it didn't matter to Jesus. He talked to her like she was one of us, like we were all the same. We are all the same. She was one of the first to recognize him as the Messiah and even go back into town and tell all of her friends. And the whole village came out 
And they all embrace Jesus because of her. One day, I'd been fishing all night, hadn't caught a thing, and was doing what I do, cleaning my nets, mending my nets, and, uh, and, and all these people were on the shore listening to Jesus talk. And, and then when he was done, he said to me, um, go, go let your net into the water and, and catch some fish. And I said, Lord, we've been out all night. We haven't caught anything. But if you say so, so we pushed out a bit from shore. We let our nets down. And there were so many fish in those nets, they were almost breaking. I remember coming ashore and, and looking up at him. I, I fell down before him. And I said, Lord, I shouldn't be here. I, I don't belong with you. <laughs> and, and I remember he, he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, don't be afraid. From now on, the same way you've caught fish, you're going to catch men. Imagine that. Me, catching men, telling others about who Jesus was. And, and not just me, like uh, my brother Andrew, we, 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 we laid down our nets. We stopped fishing that day and uh, started following him and, and telling others about him. And, and, and James and John, just, just down the shore, the, the Zebedee's boys, they followed Jesus as well and stopped fishing. And, and not just, you know, working men like us, like Levi, the tax collector. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. He left his tax collecting to follow Jesus. And when he did, he goes and tells all of his other tax collector friends about Jesus. And they have this big party to, to, to welcome Jesus. And Jesus is with them and he's laughing and he's drinking and he's involved in, in all of the festivities with them. And I remember then the Pharisees show up and their arms are crossed and their frowns on their face. And they're saying, if this guy represents God, what is he doing with these people? I remember Jesus just saying, People who think they're healthy don't need doctors. But people who know they're sick, they're willing to receive help. And this is the reason I've come. It's, it's like he turned everything upside down. He said, if you make yourself poor, you'll become rich. And if you admit that you're hungering and thirsting, you'll be filled. And if you want to be the greatest, become the servant of all. I watched thousands fed from a kid's lunch. I, I saw blind people given their sight back, lame people who could now walk. And, and after we'd watched all this, one day Jesus asked us, he said, who do men say I am? That was easy. We heard people talking and uh, we said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Others say you're one of the prophets. <laughs> but then he said, what, what about you? Who do you say I am? Suddenly, all the other guys seemed to get interested in looking at their feet. Nobody had anything to say except me. And I said, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. You're, you're, you're God's chosen one. <laughs> and, and I remember Jesus said, blessed are you. These things were, were revealed to you, not by flesh and blood, but by my Father. He was the Messiah. I knew it. But right then, he begins talking about all these terrible things that are going to be done to him. He talks about the, this terrible suffering that he's going to have to go through. So I, I take him aside and I say, Jesus, if you're if you're going to, you know, if you're the Messiah, you, you can't be talking this kind of stuff. And I remember he, he looks at me and he says, get behind me, Satan. One minute it felt like I knew so much and other moments felt like I had so much to learn. But you know, even though Jesus had to call me out, he never stopped calling me closer. Because right after that, he, he took me and James and John, we were sort of, I don't know, his go-to guys. He took us up onto the mountain and, and what we saw there it's like this 
this incredible light, but it wasn't like shining on him. It, it was almost like it was shining from him. And, and as we're watching all this, we hear this voice that, I don't know if it was from above or from everywhere, just surrounding us. And it said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listening wasn't something I was always best at. But a week and a half, maybe two weeks before it happened, we found out that Lazarus had died. Lazarus. Lazarus, his sisters, Mary and Martha, they, they were like family to Jesus. And, and so we went to Bethany and uh, he'd already been dead for two days. And Mary and Martha were not happy. Uh, I remember them saying, both of them, Lord, if you had been here, he wouldn't be dead now. But right there, Jesus, even though he was, he was upset, he, he, he wept just like all of us. He, he felt the pain and he felt the agony, but he also, he also said this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he, he, he went to the tomb, had them roll the, the, the stone away, open it. And he raised Lazarus, brought him back to life right then and there. I saw it. So did other people and, and, and news spread and people were talking about it. And, and that very next week, when we went into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, it's like everybody was talking about Jesus. And all of a sudden people begin crying out to Jesus saying, Hosanna, you know, Lord, save us. And, and, and laying down their coats in front of him as, as he came into Jerusalem on a donkey. And, and people who didn't have cloaks to, to lay down, they, they, they waved palm branches and, and they laid those down. And I thought, of course, he's going to use Passover to make his move. The very moment where we're celebrating the past deliverances of God and, and anticipating the next one, Jesus is going to make his move now at Passover. I remember later that week when we ate the Passover, still wondering when he was going to make his move. But instead, at the end of the meal, he he took bread and he, he broke it, and handed it to each one of us. And he said, eat this. This is my body, which is for you. And then even more puzzling, he, he took a cup of wine and handed it to us and said, drink this. This is my blood, which is shed for you. Well, we were still trying to get our head around what he'd said. Then he starts talking about one of you is going to betray me. And I remember looking around the room and every last one of the, the disciples were saying, Lord, is it me? Well, every one of them except, except me. I said, Jesus, uh, I don't know about these other people, but I will never leave you. I will never betray you. I will never abandon you. Jesus said, really? He said, before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny that you even knew me three times. I said, well, I'm sorry, <clears throat> but we'll have to see about that one. He talked to us for a long time. He talked to us about loving others. He talked to, talked to us about the Holy Spirit helping us. And he talked to us about how the world was going to be a harsh place. Then he took me and James and John out in the Garden of Gethsemane. And boy, was he upset. He, he was so distraught and he said, I need you guys to pray for me. We said, yeah, of course we'll pray. But it was getting late. We'd eaten a big meal. We'd had some wine. Next thing I know, he's waking me up, waking us up saying, 
guys, I, I, I need you. I need you to pray with me. I need you to support me. And, and we said, of course, yes, we will. And the next thing I know, he's waking us up again. Only this time he's going, quick, get up. It's happening. It's happening now. And we look and there's all these torches coming at us in the palace guard and Judas, Judas looking so pleased with himself with a smirk on his face, walking up and he embraces Jesus and kisses him and says, hail rabbi. As soon as he does that, they, they jump him. The, the, the mob is on him. And, and, and I, I just reacted. I, I had a dagger, so I just dove in to try to save him. I guess I should have stuck to fishing. All I did was take off some guy's ear. And, and Jesus, in the midst of it all, it's like everything came to a stop and, and he just said, put your knife away. It was like, even though they were doing these terrible things to him, he was still in control. He said, we're not going to do it this way, Peter. Don't you know, I, I've got legions of angels standing by in heaven. I could call upon them any moment if I wanted to. And no sooner had he finished saying that than the mob was back on him, kicking him, binding him. And everybody ran. I ran. I ran. I was afraid. Afraid they were going to do the same thing to me. John and I, we we ran and then we then we stopped and we we looked back and and we could see the torches leading them off to the palace of the high priest and so so we followed from a distance. They took him into the palace and John and I went up to the to the gates of the courtyard and John knew the person there. John knew everybody and he got us in not into the palace but we were in the courtyard and it was late it was cold and there was a fire so I, I went over and I, I was warming myself by the fire and as I'm warming myself this servant girl walks up to me and she says you're one of his ser one of his disciples I, I know it and I looked at her and I said I don't know what you're talking about I, I don't know him. and then uh, and another servant girl comes up and she says the same thing. You're, you're one of his followers. And I said, I am not. Leave me alone. And then others who had been hearing me talk, they come up and they go, we recognize your accent. You're a Galilean. Surely you are one of his followers. And I said, would everyone just leave me alone. I do not know the man. Damn it. Then I heard it. The rooster crowing. I denied even knowing him three times. They brought him out of the palace and, and his eyes met mine. <laughs> what could I say? I wasn't there. I wasn't there <sighs> when they took him to the Praetorium where 200 soldiers mocked him, worked him over. They made a crown of thorns and jammed it into his head. I wasn't there when they strapped him to the post and flogged him. I wasn't there when they put the cross on him and paraded him the longest route through town. I wasn't there. 
when they put him on the cross. John was there. His mother was there. Not me. Oh, big shot Peter. Big, brave Peter. I couldn't even stand up to a little girl. say he only lasted six hours. A man named Joseph asked Pilate if they could have the body. And they put him in a, in a new tomb. As far as I was concerned, my life was over. greatest person I'd never met I abandoned so lonely so isolated and then we were all together on Sunday morning and, and Mary bursts in and, and she says the tomb's empty John and I look at each other. We just ran out of the house. John got there ahead of me, but when I got to the tomb, I just ran right past him, and, and there were the grave clothes. We had no clue what was happening now. We finally met all up again at the house, and, and Mary comes in again, and she says, I've seen him. He's risen. wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't been there that night when we were all together in this one house. All of us, I think, except Thomas. And, and, and right there, as we're all together, Jesus just appears. Not exactly the way he was before. There were things that were different about him, but it was him. And he says, peace be with you. How could I have peace? I denied that I even knew him three times. Everybody else was so excited, but I just felt so afraid. And finally, one day I just said, I'm going fishing. I don't know what else to do with myself, so maybe this is what I gotta go back to. And I remember a couple others said, we'll come with you. And we went out that morning and we fished and we didn't catch anything. And as we were packing our nets up, we were still out on the water. This person calls out to us from the shore and he says, friends, have you caught any fish? And we said, no. I thought, I've had this conversation before. And then he says, put your nets down on the other side. And, and as we put them down and began realizing that, that, that there were more fish than we could probably count, I realized it was Jesus. It was Jesus on the shore talking to us. And as crazy as this sounds, even though I knew, I knew that I had failed him, I knew that I could run to him. And so I just jumped out of the boat, swam ashore and and it was Jesus. He had a fire going, he had fish cooking for us. And, and when the other guys came with the boat, we all ate together. We got dried out, warmed up. But then Jesus turned to me and he said, Simon, do you really love me? more than all the rest of these? I said, Lord, you, you know who I am. You know I want to. And he said, then I want you to feed my sheep. 
And after a moment, he, he said to me a second time, Simon, do you really love me? I said, Lord, you know I want to try. And he said, then tend to my lambs. I knew it was coming. That third time, I knew he was going to ask me just the same way I denied him three times. The third time he asks me. Only this time he said, Simon, are you ready to try again? I said, Lord, you know all things. You know I, I love you and I want to try. He said, then feed my lambs. Imagine that. Me, who was farthest from him, was brought closest. <laughs> I thought he was going to conquer the world by running over the enemies of God with power. Instead, he gave himself for all of us. That's why he's my, my master, my redeemer, my king, and my finest friend.